importantly, this in the previous session is recorded and posted on the BC Regional website. Uh, we are hosting this session on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples. That includes the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh Tooth Nations, and the Métis Charter Community of the Lower Mainland Region. And you, wherever you are in this province or on Turtle Island, uh, you are on uh, respected lands that uh, we promise to care for. And in the current context of uh, the various climate change issues and shortages that have occurred, even most recently of water at uh, in uh, the South Island, I think we forever uh, will respect and uh, attempt to care for this land. Next slide. So this is province-wide rounds. As you know, it is a collaborative enterprise between the UBC Division of Nephrology and BC Renal, proudly uh, supported by a number of our industry partners, as well as the health authorities, and uh, is intended to ensure uh, equitable access to education and uh, initiatives around the province. So thank you all for attending. Next slide. So Dr. Eileen Hargrove, who I uh, inter um, who I introduced a while ago, I'll just remind you, she is uh, a practicing nephrologist in Victoria who uh, hails from Calgary as her alma mater for her university and medical school and has been a part of the palliative care committee um, for over a decade and is now the lead of it um, and is going to bring us part two of the Integrated Palliative Nephrology Project Evaluation um, Program, uh, giving us today the healthcare provider results. So I'll hand it over to you, Gaylene. Thank you, Kanye, dear, for that kind uh, introduction. Um, I'd like to begin by uh, gratefully and humbly acknowledging that I'm hosting this presentation and I work with and play on the unceded traditional territory of the Okongan people of the Esquimalt and Songhees Nations and the Wasanich Nation. And I strive to learn more about their culture and healing practices so that I may be an active participant in facilitating their healing moving forward and building trusting relationships with our Indigenous um, peoples. Next slide, please. Now, before I begin, I would be remiss if I did not give a huge shout out to the leadership provided by my dear colleague, Dr. John Antonson, and, and also our division lead, uh, Dr. Michael Schachter, who um, with the amazing team at the Royal Jubilee Hospital, um, the renal program care providers, they rallied to get through an emergency situation yesterday afternoon, which included the cessation of all water to the Royal Jubilee Hospital, thereby resulting in immediate termination of all of the afternoon patients' uh, hemodialysis treatments. Um, there were staff members that came from all the different parts of the hospital to help out in the renal unit. Many, many thanks to all of them. It's a testament to how committed and, and passionate they are about keeping our patients safe and healthy. So thank you to them. So our learning objectives for this morning, um, based on, this is part two, the healthcare provider results from our IPN evaluation project it's to inform frontline healthcare providers in BC involved in the care of CKD patients about healthcare professionals' perspectives related to integrating a palliative approach in daily practice, and to describe how effective the IPM project was in enhancing the capacity of care providers in integrating a palliative approach in CKD care. Next slide. So the purpose um, of this evaluation, specific to healthcare providers' perspectives, was to evaluate the understanding, knowledge, and perspectives of healthcare providers on a palliative approach to renal care following the implementation of the IPN project. And today we are presenting the results of uh, three categories of evaluation methods, um, the healthcare provider survey, the interviews and the focus groups. Next slide, please. So first, the survey. Uh, next. 
In terms of demographics, you can see based on the bar graphs um, which health authority the various participants hailed from. Um, large representation from Fraser Health. Thank you to all of those in Fraser and all the other health authorities who participated. And you can see that there was quite um, a seasoned vintage in terms of how many years uh, these participants have worked in their roles in their health authority. Next slide, please. And in terms of the actual roles, um, most who participated were nurses, but we see there's representation from all different disciplines, um, including uh, two nurse practitioners, um, dietitian, pharmacist, other represents um, uh, nursing unit coordinator, uh, technician, uh, and uh, also representation from social work. Next. So the first theme um, in terms of the line of questioning was related to comfort, uh, your level of comfort with following patient and family interactions. So um, first of all, uh, giving bad news to a patient or family member, and then uh, secondly, discussing uh, do not resuscitate orders, options for end of life and goals of care, which may or may not include the medical uh, orders for scope of treatment or the most. So uh, you can see a pattern uh, evolving here whereby nephrologists and social workers um, split in terms of the nurse practitioners, which is interesting, in terms of the comfort level. So nephrologists and social workers um, tend to feel very comfortable, um, nursing staff somewhat comfortable, and then um, getting into the areas of dietitian and pharmacist, somewhat uncomfortable. Um, you know, likely depending on their practice scope, their training and education. Um, so it's, these results aren't too surprising. Next. So then onward to discussing a home hospice referral and then discussing a shift in treatment approach from intensive care to comfort or palliative care. So um, there, are those who were, you know, very comfortable and somewhat comfortable. And then, you know, it seems to be somewhat split, but reassuring that uh, there's quite a large percentage that fall into the very comfortable or somewhat comfortable categories. Next. And in terms of discussing the option to stop dialysis comfort level, um, it's really split between, you know, all the different categories here. Um, but again, uh, it is encouraging that there's a large contingent who feel very comfortable or somewhat comfortable. Next. And in terms of the split amongst the disciplines discussing the option to stop dialysis specifically, um, there are uh, nephrologists and social workers who feel very comfortable. Nursing staff tends to feel very or somewhat comfortable. Um, and then again, uh, dietitians, pharmacists um, split between the nurse practitioners. Uh, they tend to feel less comfortable. Next. Now, this is an interesting question. Again, this is asking the healthcare professional based on their perspective, how well do your patients understand their diagnosis? Now, um, those of you who are well apprised of the serious illness conversation, this is actually the first question. What is your understanding of where things are at with your illness? And um, sometimes came up <laughs> as the, uh, greatest category. Now, um, it is surprising when we would perhaps ask a patient who's been on dialysis a number of years, um, have you thought about, you know, what your life would be like if you stopped dialysis or maybe they'd even put forward, they would like to, um, 
reduce the frequency or reduce the hours or they've been thinking about stopping and um and then you get further in the conversation they ask you well what what would happen if i stopped and you you share with them that they would die because this is life supportive therapy and they're surprised by that answer um, and that does come up thankfully not frequently but sometimes so um this is actually quite an integral issue to um, the patient then moving forward with um, a palliative approach in their care. Next slide, please. So this, these questions relate to knowledge, skills, and barriers to delivering a palliative approach to renal care. Um, the first addressed um, whether knowledge and ability um, to have conversations so knowledge about the palliative approach and ability to have acp discussions uh, advanced care planning discussions over the past three years um, through the initiatives of the ipn project and developed resources this was addressing whether um, these healthcare prof professionals feel as though they've improved um, and most either agree most when they agree category which was encouraging um, next please next slide please and in terms of identifying barriers that um, these uh, health care providers currently face in terms of delivering a palliative approach um, these seem to be divided into three categories that, um, in terms of the providers themselves organizational and then um, on the part of the patients so um there's often this is a very very consistent theme lack of time and heavy workload particularly these days with the workforce shortage uh, that's critical um unclear roles and responsibilities so that's something that we picked up on that certainly um we can take steps to improve upon um, in terms of clarifying uh lack of documentation uh, their own emotions or beliefs, so acknowledgement that there may be biases within themselves, um, lacking in terms of knowledge and experience, lack of training, education, um, and fragmented communication between staff. And then in terms of organizational um, limited access, um, in terms of health authority resources, uh, feeling that the virtual visits, which have come on since the COVID pandemic began, um, they may hinder opportunities for discussion or depersonalize things. Um, difficult to coordinate care across different patient needs, um, particularly if they're seeing many different subspecialists, perhaps with different um, messages, mixed messages. And then the patients themselves, um, patient comfort level or resistance from family, and then language, culture, age, gender, and cognitive difference. Next slide. So in terms of the palliative care resources that were developed by the IPN project over the last six months, how often have you accessed these uh, that are available on the BC Renal website? Um, so there were a, a large number, a uh, large percentage that had not access, perhaps were not aware of them or um, felt that there wasn't really a relevant uh, need to access them. Could, find them easily on the website. Um, and then there, there was quite a large percentage that had used them one to five times over the past six months. And then um, some who had actually used them over 10 times. Next. If you did access them, which ones did you find particularly useful? So there was quite a significant percentage that had um, used the symptom management algorithms and um, also the patient education documents, uh, the serious illness conversation guide, um, and less represented were the advanced care planning documents that, and the um, recommendations to support uh, end stage kidney disease patients at the end of life. Next. In terms of suggestions for improving these tools that are available on the website, um, so either to add or modify, um, 
there were some who came up with some very uh, helpful ideas, um, some points about prognosis and a visual journey map of all the different outcomes uh, on each modality, um, links to Ministry of Health forms, for instance, the, um, the out of hospital or the community do not resuscitate order um, and uh, forms that allow access for our patients to um, have full coverage for palliative uh, comfort related and symptom management related uh, medications, referral guides for palliative services within communities, um, and these vary community to community, um, life expectancy, again, related to prognosis. Um, there's a comment that the symptom management content might be repetitive, maybe, uh, but that could be as a result of its comprehensive nature um, as well. And um, a standardized single form for uh, primary care providers that outlines recommendations for the care of the patient. Again, a communication tool. Next slide, please. Do you have any suggestions for um, uh, improving, again, um, format or other features to consider? And this is specific to the website itself. So. Uh, some IT savvy folks thought a chat function would be helpful. Um, a, a bit more old school then would be handouts, printouts for increased accessibility, uh, availability in different languages, very important for many of our patients, um, particularly in the Fraser Health region and, and also Vancouver Coastal that um, could really benefit from having these uh, resources in different languages. Um, improve the awareness of tools and increase education um, in terms of the location on the website, how to navigate to access them, and more webinars, live learning uh, platforms, and then services. Next. So key messages from the survey included um, the fact that provider knowledge on a palliative approach to care and ability to have advanced care planning discussions have improved post IPN project implementation. The opportunity uh, exists definitely, and we are going to grab onto this for next steps um, that are a natural progression from this project. We want to target education on improving provider comfort in patient and family discussions with a focus on DNR, goals of care, options for end-of-life discussions, and ensuring patients understand their prognosis, which is really pivotal to um, all of these discussions moving forward. There are um, in existence several barriers, some perceived, some real, at the provider and organization level that hinder the ability to deliver a palliative approach to care. Um, and increasing the awareness uh, and accessibility of existing palliative care tools, uh, we hope will help improve its use by providers. Next slide. So on to the interviews now. Uh, next, there were 15 healthcare professionals who um, we, we want to extend our sincere gratitude for uh, generously um, volunteering their time and energy for these interviews. Um, in terms of the roles, um, there was a large contingent of social workers, nephrologists, uh, pharmacists, as well, um, also nurses and dietitians, and most of the representation was from Fraser and Vancouver Coastal. Um, so many thanks to those of you. Also, representation uh, from the island and Interior Health. Uh, unfortunately, Northern Health was not represented. Next slide, please. So, uh, in terms of the provider role, so again, this. If you'll remember, there was um, felt to be in existence a barrier to delivering a palliative approach if roles and responsibilities were not clear. Um, so in terms of current responsibilities, um, these participants felt that um, they, they were asked about, you know, do you feel as though part of your role and responsibility includes advanced care planning discussions, goals of care discussions, symptom management, referral to other services, 
psychosocial support, dietary management, and uh, legal paperwork. And so um, based on these, the participants were asked, should a palliative approach to care be within the scope of your role? Um, and there were 10 who uh, are represented here and most were in the yes camp there. Next, please. And in terms of education and training, question related to have you received education and or training within the past three years? All 15 answered and the majority were in the yes camp. And um, in terms of what type of education and training, uh, most had been through the serious illness conversation training, uh, some uh, verbal presentations and webinars, uh, some had actually participated in a palliative rotation in terms of their clinical training and in their orientation to their initial job. Um, and just some comments, strengths regarding the education and training. training. Um, I really liked the patient-centered approach. I think it was a good opening to know how the discussion was approached for my practice. Next. So in terms of um, feedback for improvement, most of this came from nephrologists. Um, they felt that the serious homeless conversation training uh, might be, uh, there might be greater uptake if it was distilled into a shorter time frame. Um, and acknowledge that it's difficult to implement in the KCC setting when, when time is not on your side. And then uh, question, was raised what education or training would help you moving forward. Um, some felt a specific uh, education session on symptom management would be uh, effective, providing an opportunity for palliative care elective block in their clinical uh, training, focused teaching related to um, province-wide rounds, which we're doing this morning, academic half days, um, a webinar with with case-based discussion or a simulation session, uh, information about options for patients at end of life, so specific to that issue. Um, and again, very specifically, content on medically uh, assisted death and a place on the website for the most up-to-date objective research and data. So very helpful feedback there. Next. So, these relate to uh, provider perceptions um, and how do you feel about having these advanced care planning and goals of care and end of life discussions with your patients and the size of the um, rectangle here depicts how often these uh, were chosen and most felt moderately comfortable or a large percentage um, some actually expressed enjoyment um, Many, uh, I myself, I still feel anxious and nervous sometimes, so that was raised, um, and, and stress, yes, we're stressed for so many different reasons these days, time, uh, again, time constraints being one of them, you're, you're having a serious conversation and, you know, your phone or pager goes off, or there's a code blue being called on the overhead, and um, these are, these are, you know, issues that just add to an already potentially stressful situation. Um, some feel a bit, a bit bad. So it's, these aren't necessarily happy topics for discussion. So um, there may be some, some sadness or, or, you know, very di different emotions that um, are at play. Next. So these are specific comments related to how we might improve discussions with patients. Um, we want to solve people's problems all the time. That's how we're trained. It was really letting go of that training and saying, I'm not here to solve your problem. I'm just here to listen to you. That act of listening is such a skill um, and for some, a real gift that patients really appreciate. I kind of ease into it and not take away any kind of their hope that 
life is going to be so bad, especially when somebody is starting to get kind of overwhelmed and it might sound odd. Um, to me, it's always been sort of a time to have that conversation where then you give them control back. Tell them that it's always their choice. They never, uh, they never have to do it and that there's support. I think referring to they never have to feel pressured into an active intervention called dialysis. The way I frame it with patients is you want to have these things in place when you are fairly healthy rather than when your health declines even more than it has now. And then you're sort of scrambling. You want to do these things when you're far more competent rather than have somebody else make these decisions. If you're sitting in and watching other colleagues doing it, it is not easy. Next. So again, provider perceptions um, in terms of how patients feel about these discussions. And there was quite a large rectangle that um, the feeling on the healthcare provider side was that the patients are reluctant to have these discussions. And in fact, it's actually a small proportion of patients who are truly reluctant. There are many, many published studies that indicate there's a, a much greater than much more than 50% of patients who actually want to engage in these discussions. Um, and uh, so there's a, there's discordance in perception there, healthcare provider to patient. Um, some feel that they are receptive and, and understanding. Um, some may feel their patients are actually relieved or grateful and others um, sometimes and, and this is actually expressed by some patients where um, they immediately jump to, oh, you're giving up, you're, we're, we're stopping, we're giving up, you're, you're not going to do anything anymore. Um, where in fact, the messaging can and should be that palliation is active treatment. Next. So this question related to um, how much has or has your confidence um, in providing uh, an integrated palliative approach increased over the past three years? Um, the large majority said yes, they felt it had. And what specifically has helped improve your confidence? Simply the experience, um, actual specific courses on uh, motivational interviewing, diversity and inclusion, Developing rapport with patients. So um, the theme around the developing relationship um, does often come up. And seeing, actually seeing and experiencing yourself, the positive outcomes of patients who choose to stop dialysis. Um, and, and sheer willpower. So some healthcare professionals just will themselves to get better at it, just through practice. Next. So the next question, do you believe a palliative approach to care is being implemented effectively currently in the setting? 14 answered, um, and it was somewhat split. So 50% felt that it was, um, maybe not all the time. And then uh, there was a percentage that felt that no, it was not. Um, some success factors in terms of what helped to promote the effectiveness, um, really empowering patients to have a voice, to, to take the reins, so to speak, to be in the driver's seat. Um, nephrologists who take initiative um, are helpful because they, they have already built very good relationships with patients. Um, uh, being able to refer to a palliative care program, knowing how to access the palliative care resources locally, Establ establishing a list of patients who are prioritized by which urgent cases need conversations. So that relates to patient identification, a uh, supportive team who debriefs regularly, and um, shift in practice culture and, and a focus on data relating to um, for instance, pain symptom management, the quality metrics that, that we report every six months include pain and symptom management or the, the, the ESAS, the uptake on the ESAS tool, as well as um, the uh, documented ACP module of promise. 
um, and then awareness of tools and resources next. So some of the challenges in terms of implementing the palliative approach to renal care, um, patients are still unsure about some of the terminology, and we have to be careful about the words we use. Um, my comment related to we're very um, good at uh, not initiating, perhaps, but we're bad at stopping dialysis. Um, that's interesting, though, that we the perception is that we become good at not initiating because that hasn't always been the case either. Uh, COVID-19 virtual clinics reduce discussions and cause increased disconnect between patients and families about patient wishes. Um, loss of experience now, so there's been a great deal of turnover all over the past year or so. Patients who have not received any information uh, leading up to their start on dialysis or they crash into the system, they often feel overwhelmed. And that was reflected in the patient interviews um, that I presented as part one uh, a month ago. Healthcare system emphasizes intervention and treatment, so that relates to the culture of practice. And again, confusion around roles and responsibilities. So that theme has come up quite often. Next. So in terms of the resources that you're aware of, um, only uh, um, five of the 15 were not aware. So 10 of the 15 were aware of the resources available. And you can see there the split um, between which of the various specific resources that are on the BC Renal website. Um, and some also available in printed form, for instance, the pamphlets related to stopping dialysis treatment and frequently asked questions about stopping dialysis. Um, those come in different formats, both online and hard copies. Um, so there was quite a great deal of uptake in terms of some of those patient related resources. And then again, the serious illness conversation um, is utilized often. So in terms of the quality of the resources, most felt that they were very good, excellent, quite thorough and relevant, um, user-friendly and appropriate uh, volume in terms of uh, both volume of information and level of writing. Um, and then suggestions for improvement. So um, it was felt that we can and should improve the awareness of the fact that these resources exist and where to find them, um, include some content on nutritional approaches. Um, that's very helpful feedback. And um, again, additional translations, different languages. Um, and there were a couple of comments that uh, for some of these, maybe the content is, is too bulky. Next. So again, some specific comments. Um, it's nice that we're looking at that because going back a few years, it was, you know, transplant dialysis or just status quo, I guess, rather than it being an active option. So again, referring to um, a conservative supportive approach as being an active option. I would say it has increased, the openness has increased. And in part, I would say that's because the nephrology team in particular, the physicians and so forth, or at least in my experience, have become more direct about having those conversations and being quite upfront of that. So there's been a shift in the culture talking about a palliative approach to care that I think is more open now. I think this is a great body of work. I just have only positive things to say about it. I know there's been a ton of investment in this and lots of people working really hard to make this happen and to keep it going and to update the guidelines. And I think it's all really, really important. Yes. So finally, the focus groups. Um, next. So we have three different focus groups, many thanks to these individuals, um, where we, in I think many cases, hijacked their already scheduled meetings and um, established ourselves in the agenda so that we could carry these through. Um, so thank you so much for all who participated. Um, there was the, the PDRN group, the Home Hemodialysis Educator Group, and our own Palliative Care Committee. 
So this thing came up, the nephrologist as the quarterback. So we as physicians have unique responsibilities that our other team members depend on in order to deliver an effective palliative approach to care. So we help provide information about prognosis. And this is where documentation is extremely important. Other team members might not have the education and um, knowledge based on our relationship with the patient too. Um, so the other team members may not know as much as we do. And we also have the opportunity and ability to build relationships with the primary care provider for our patients. So a uh, comment was that it's so important for the nephrologist to have those conversations because it opens up a doorway. The patients want to kind of unpack that conversation with someone. The nurse or social workers are there to be that sounding board and continue on that conversation. So it's very much nice as like a team approach to have somebody begin the conversation so that the patient feels more comfortable continuing on. Next. So again, the importance of the team, um, the support, the shared responsibility, um, alignment. So sometimes our responsibilities cross-cut, sometimes they're, they're very distinct, um, but it's very helpful to clarify the roles and responsibilities up front um, and to be open and transparent about that. Team meetings with patients and families are helpful to steer the conversation. Um, the various team members have separate skill sets, but again, there's a shared responsibility to deliver a palliative approach to care Often nephrologists and pharmacists work together um, in terms of de-prescribing medication and um, providing, ensuring they're providing goal-directed medical treatment. Um, and I believe it's so important in terms of pain and symptom management, for instance, um, work, working together to um, optimize patient comfort. When the team isn't aligned, providers feel less confident in having these discussions with patients, especially if there's a perception that there's mixed messages next. So again, this theme of the open door approach um, and reference to the open-ended questions, um, all participants generally felt comfortable who participate in, in these focus groups. Uh, they feel comfortable having discussions um, in particular, the home hemodialysis nurses have already built strong trust-based relationships with their patients, just simply related to the nature of their role. Um, good conversations occur when providers spend time listening. So we should not be talking the most, our patients should be. And use open-ended guiding questions that are listed below. And even when patients initially might feel uncomfortable, using this open door approach can help build subsequent rapport and confidence. And of course, this is a progression. You, you, you don't start with that last question there. You know, how do you see yourself if you stop dialysis, especially if you're, you know, just starting dialysis. However, however, it is important. Um, and this message I'm noting is being delivered more and more in the kidney care clinics, whereby through modality education, the message and the information to the patient is inclusive of the fact that you choose to start, you can choose to stop at any time. And it's important that patients know that they have that, that right, that ability, that it's certainly within their purview to stop. Um, if they feel that they're not gaining benefit or simply if the burden of dialysis is now outweighing the benefit. Next. So this is the last slide based on these focus groups um, and their feedback. And again, these barriers, I will just put forward that 
some are real, some are perceived. Um, there may be discordance between what the patients feel and what we as healthcare providers feel. But it is important to address and acknowledge these barriers, whether real or perceived, and to try to overcome them. Cultural competency, we have the tools and resources to overcome this. Uh, we have to take action as healthcare providers. And I've certainly tasked myself with continued education in this area because it's so, so important. And this relates to all of the following, our Indigenous patients, of course, but also other patients who have decided that Canada is the best country to live in. And I couldn't agree more as a proud uh, settler in Canada myself, but it's important that we address the specific cultural needs of our patients from South Asia, other parts of Asia, um, and, and from all over the world, really. Uh, and, and we may have more settlers from Ukraine coming, and we have their specific needs, and they will have their own trauma, base needs um, that we need to attend to as well. Patient discomfort has been mentioned, um, discussions by phone, um, not as personalized, certainly, but there are ways and means to, um, to continue to have these discussions, particularly for those who are geographically remote, um, where that is going to be our default. And, and we, we simply have to learn how to continue to build trusting relationships virtually, um, perhaps not addressing goals of care up front. Um, and, and that's very important where we engage with patients by asking them what matters most to them. Um, there are certainly competing priorities for, for all of us, but particularly social workers these days that limit their time that they spend on having these um, serious uh, conversations, these advanced care planning conversations, and patient misunderstanding about what advanced care planning is. So um, I thank you for your time and attention next. I will share with you here our resources, um, many of which are listed as being on the BC Renal website. And that's how one navigates through um, the various tabs to click on. So you can go to healthcare professionals and then palliative care, and then to guidelines and tools. And all of the following are there um, that and they're downloadable, printable, um, if you want to uh, conserve the, the paper, by all means, pass along the uh, links and accessible uh, pathways to your patients and, uh, and your colleagues, your uh, fellow healthcare providers. Uh, the serious illness conversation, all of the updates um, are on Ariadne what, Labs website there. There's the BC Center for Palliative Care uh, website there that is has some extremely helpful um, resources and um, I, I will put a plug in for a recent webinar that I attended um, that was entitled um, the platinum rule all that glitters is not gold it was fantastic um, it speaks to um, dignity conserving care and it was excellent. Um, it is posted, uh, I believe, um, on their website, or at least um, speaks to it, uh, how to access it. And then hopefully BC. Next. So I must, um, with gr great gratitude, um, thank the following for their participation. Uh, their ongoing feedback, their support. 
Um, so the, the PCC members, um, healthcare professionals and nephrologists who participated in, in uh, either the HBUs or the focus groups or perhaps even both and the survey, um, the PDRN group and the home hemodialysis educators group, all of the healthcare providers who participated in the survey uh, and individual interviews. Um, of course, our project managers, uh, initially Sarah Thomas for our IPN project itself, and then the IPN evaluation project. Our manager was Yancy uh, Rajmohan. Uh, of course, Sue Saunders, um, our director of home therapies and palliative care. Uh, Selma Wadwania, our uh, coordinator um, for projects, our administrative support who, um, is unfailing in terms of her ability to coordinate all of these uh, interviews, distribute the surveys, uh, collate them, and um, really can't express enough gratitude um, to these individuals. And of course, Courtney Bell, who um, really helped support us um, during Selma, Selma's leave uh, as an administrative assistant. So many thanks. Next. So I'll open it up for questions, comments, uh, at this time. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Gaylene. So as always, you've uh, provoked us to uh, think deeply and, uh, and consider what we do in our clinical practices um, for the entire healthcare team members. Um, and I'm just wondering if there are questions or comments that people want to make. Otherwise, I have something afterwards. There's many of you on the call. So if you could either put in the chat or um, a comment or a question. I guess one of the things, and I think you might have addressed this last time, but I still, um, I wonder what kind of exposure our medical students and our general medical residents get in terms of not being asked to do it, but rather watching and, uh, and, you know, having some modeling, because I think that part of the fear that you described is that if you've never seen it done well, then it's pretty scary to try and do it yourself. And I just don't know what the appetite is in the current learning environments to have, as I said, medical student residents and fellows just observe people who are comfortable doing this do it a few times before they're actually asked to do it at the, you know, at two o'clock in the morning with a stranger and emerge, which is never a good thing. Just your Thank thoughts you so about that. for that question. Um, it's very timely and relevant because the lovely fourth year EDC student um, that has, she's just rounding off her two week clinical elective with me today. And she is, at, she's actually applied to pediatrics programs, so that's the context. But just you know, despite that, she she just ate it up when she observed me engaging in a very sil serious goals of care discussion with a patient of mine, and it was via telehealth, so on speakerphone, and I asked his permission. He was comfortable with being on speakerphone um, and, and knew that there was a learner there. Felt it was very important for her. And she she just, she sat, didn't, she just took it all in, listened very attentively, very active listening. And it was actually a very positive interaction. I've known this patient for many years, probably about a decade. So these, there was an established relationship. And I would encourage for those of you who, um, who are going to engage in a virtual goals of care discussion, please ensure there is a trusting established relationship first, because otherwise it, and even then, even then these can go sideways. You never know. But many of our decisions are based on Two emotions, fear or faith. And yes, you may be fearful, but you have to have the faith that this established relationship is going to enable you to really get to what matters most to this patient. And the context was that he has progressive cardiorenal syndrome, increasingly difficult to 
actually safely dialyzed because of intradialytic hypotension, failing heart. And about five kilogram weight loss in the last six months um, and, and really struggling to stay at home. Um, and also has uh, advanced COPD. So very symptomatic uh, all of the time in terms of air hunger and still listed as a full code, full resuscitation. Um, and so I really felt it was important to find out if this is really what, what the patient wants. And it went better than I anticipated. He, it turned out he already had a living will and advanced care directive had established who was designated um, temporary substitute decision makers would be, um, named them by name, told me about his children. I learned more about him in having this conversation. And at the end, my student just said, wow, I've never seen that before. I've never had the opportunity to watch, to observe, and I'm so glad I did. I've tried to have this discussion so many times at two in the morning and it's because i'm tasked with it and the expectation is that there's going to be a most that's ordered and and that's simply what i have to do i've never felt good about it yeah i think what i was going to just editorialize like i mean i think because it's become a transactional tick the box thing that people must do when you admit someone to pay to thing i think it's lost the the heart or the soul or the intention of it and uh, that'll take a little bit or a lot of work to wrestle that back because i was speaking to the residents the other day and they said yeah but you know the nurse won't let you send somebody up to the ward unless they've got a, a code status so you have to do it I said well you don't have to do it well, I think, going I think to do it in the next 12 hours having discussed with their primary physician or whatever whatever i'm just conscious there's a Question yeah. from uh, Dr. Hung about whether or not we have interviews with patients and or their families and their experiences uh, as some feedback, or if that's another phase of this. Um, so that we, we did have that in part one um, in terms of the patient experience. Um, and, you know, the, there were limited numbers, of course, there are only 16 patients, but um, they, this particular um, presentation related just to the primary or, or the provider results. So, but the patient results were presented as, as part one. So, right. So that's, that's worthwhile. And um, Carolyn was reflecting on health literacy of patients and I think that does come into it because I think how one approaches different people depending on their health literacy will obviously uh, impact, right? Absolutely, yes. Like I said, as we mentioned, we have to be careful with our words. They'll be different for every different patient, right? It yeah. depends on how well we know them. So if I am tasking myself with anything, it's to really get to strive to get to know my patient better, build that relationship. Um, you know, the patient dignity question that's spoken about in this Platinum Rule webinar. What should I know about you in order to deliver the best possible care? Right. And I think, yeah, that's, and that's about knowing who they are and what they're, um, thereby you will know their literacy, right? Um, other questions? I'm just trying to check that I haven't missed anything. Whoops. Um, well, well, there are there 44 participants. There are yes, there were at the height there were 54, which is pretty terrific on a Friday morning. There's one last question. Interesting. Uh, what can a nutritionist offer in a palliative approach? Oh, thank you for that. That's. We save the best for last. My dietitians know the patients, some of them better than I do. When you talk about food, that leads to chat about other things. Think about it. What 
are we doing when we're eating? Are we spending that time with family? Is it a family dinner? That segues into who's important at these family dinners? Who does the shopping for the food? Who does the cooking? Do you participate in the cooking? Is that something you enjoy? Is that important to you? They are asking about what matters most to patients all the time. So dietitians, all of you who are listening today, please don't be fearful about venturing across that threshold. And please tell us as nephrologists the things we need to know um, that we don't, that we clearly don't know in order to better deliver a palliative approach. So right. I, I think honestly you are instrumental as part of the team. Great. And one last question, Naomi. You want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Sorry, I ended up putting it in the chat. Um, I trained it approach, first and foremost, Galen, thank you so much for this really important work. This is a topic that I felt quite passionately about um, since the time I was training. And it's really interesting to see how my approach has shifted as, as I've become a busier and busier clinician. And it is, to be honest, a little bit painful to see that it's still a struggle to make space and time to do this work with the patience and grace it requires. And really hats off to you for emphasizing it. Um, I, I continue to feel really strongly that we have to create space, time, and emphasis for our physician and our multidisciplinary teams to do this work. Not just say it, that they should do it because we all should, right? Should, could, would, but how do we actually create a framework for the space and time? In any case, I did want to emphasize something else, which um, for me was really impactful as a learner. We had a chaplain in our renal program when I was training. And this chaplain rounded in our dialysis units and our satellite units. They very much helped team members navigate these discussions. They also very much help patients prepare for these discussions because one of the challenges is our society doesn't talk about this. And so when you bring it up, it's almost novel to so many patients. And I know how often this comes as a surprise to me, how, you know, the comment from patients is, how, how is this happening to me all of a sudden? How, how did I get sick? How am I confronting end of life? And I often find that so surprising given the burden of disease, the advanced age, but it, what it says to me at least is that there's such a disconnect um, in our culture between um, life processes, birth, critical events and end of life. And then we come in and we introduce them at crucial events, of course, patients struggle to understand. Anyhow, those were a lot of words to say gratitude, but also plant the seed that may be engaging those who truly thrive in the practice of spiritual health would be an add-on for our program. And if not, we really do need to create bandwidth, time for our clinicians to not just learn, but practice this work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, That's great. Yeah, what a what a great way to end. And I think you know there were um, it, there were times where we did have chaplains associated with many of the programs in uh, BC. I don't know if they're all still uh, viable, but uh, these are all things that we um, <laughs> have lost as the healthcare system is more and more stretched. But again, uh, on behalf of the whole province, uh, Gaylene. Uh, to you and the team, because I know very much this is a team effort um, for the work that you're doing and for the fact that we have these excellent talks, the first one and this second one on the BC Renal website. I think that's excellent uh, training. And again, I know that the medical school does you know, sort of value experiential training, but perhaps we, along with our palliative care and other chronic disease groups need to advocate a little bit more for that, you know, observational learning as opposed to, you know, in the moment observational learning and, and uh, modify the way that um, we train 
people. But again, thank you everyone. And thanks all for your participation. It's really terrific. Happy Friday. Thank you.